Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adlarsson, outdated uh, to state solution, muddling through. Um, is, is the two state solution dead? Oslo process dead? No, uh, and let me start by l looking a bit at the uh, broader uh, picture, first in an historical uh, context. So the Oslo agreement uh, are several phenomena. So one is the idea of the two-state solution, the ideology. The other is the institution, the Palestinian Authority, which is sitting in front of me here. And it is uh, the, the uh, peace process. Uh, these are the main um, um, uh, elements. So the Palestinian Authority is existing. It's under very heavy pressure. But uh, compared with many other uh, governance structures in the region, is actually functioning, functioning pretty well under all the stresses it has. And that's a big compliment to the leadership of the, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the uh, two-state solution, I, uh, the ideology I do profoundly believe, is the only way. And I think actually it's uh, heartening that both Mike and Saab agree with that. And there is a fundamental agreement about that. <coughs> I think the uh, one-state solution uh, would be a disaster for the Palestinians and a disaster for the Israelis. And this means that in this perspective, when I'm asked, are you pro-Palestinian or are you pro-Israeli, I can very happily answer both. I'm pro-Palestinian and I'm pro-Israeli, because that solution is in the best interest of both. A reoccupation of the West Bank and Gaza will be a disaster for, for, if, for the Palestinians and maybe equally a disaster for the Israelis. And I think both Mike and Saab would, uh, would uh, agree with that. Then, Dalia, um, uh, I, 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 the way I read what you said, uh, you had two points. Uh, one is that the Palestinians might adapt to whatever muddling through might lead to. And I don't think that's the case. Because Palestinian, I mean, this is about identity. And Palestinian identity is glued to the idea of a Palestinian state. And there will never be peace before that state is there. Because the Palestinians will not give up their identity. So that conflict will then go on forever. And this is why I do believe profoundly that structurally the two-state solution is profoundly in the Israeli interest and profoundly in the Palestinian interest. And that by force of history, it will happen. But it, will, it might take a very long time. And many, many mistakes might be, uh, might be done on the road. Then to what I agree with you, uh, uh, Dalia. I mean, if we, if we look at the geopolitical uh, landscape of the region, <laughs> it is fundamentally changed since Oslo. Uh, and the reason being that at that time, there was one defining conflict in the region uh, in a horizontal axis. It was the Israeli-Arab conflict. It defined everything <laughs> in the region. Today, there is, on a, there is a vertical line. It's a kind of a cross where you have another conflict, which is between Iran and its allies and proxies, and the leading Sunni Arab states, in particularly Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and uh, the United Arab Emirates, which is, to many in the region, <coughs> the defining conflict of the region, and which has also brought Israel and these leading Sunni Arab states together. And this is why you, uh, you um, alluded to it, uh, uh, Dalia, <laughs> is that, I mean, there is a deep security cooperation between these states and uh, Israel uh, uh, under the table. Uh, there is a deep um, intelligence sharing cooperation uh, going on. And more and more openly, uh, uh, this appears. And this creates a new context, which creates a difficulty for, uh, our, for, for our Palestinian friends. But we have to be aware that this is a new context, and which means that I, I agree with you, Dalia, there has to be a regional component into a Palestinian-Israeli settlement. Yeah. So Can I, just say uh, I have a follow-up question there. Um, first, you say that, uh, Mr. Adlarsson, that it's profoundly in the interest of both the Palestinians and the Israelis <laughs> with the two-state solution. But when you follow now the Israeli election campaign, um, uh, it's definitely a situation where Israel has moved uh, to the right on this uh, issue. Do you think that uh, Mr. Netanyahu, if he's re-elected as prime minister, will change the rhetoric after the election campaign? Do you think uh, Netanyahu also agrees with you? You know him well for 30 years. 
that the two-state solution is the best solution, or um, is he thinking about something else, and what is that? As a former uh, Norwegian politician, you know very well that uh, election rhetoric <laughs> is sometimes fundamentally different from what happens Not after in Norway. The you know, should know that. <laughs> <laughs> I um, read your sarcasms. Uh, so, um, uh, and I think the Israeli Prime Minister uh, understands fully uh, the uh, difficulties of moving towards an annexation of the West Bank, say. Because then Israel will have to shoulder the full legal, economic, and social responsibilities for all the Palestinians. And I don't think any Israeli prime minister would be willing to do that. It would be a catastrophe for the state of Israel if that happens. So it would be a catastrophe for the Palestinians, and it would be a catastrophe for... Uh, <laughs> and, and I think any Israeli government, I mean, will even a very right-wing government, will when it comes to decision to the decision making point mm. will be hesitant uh, to put it understated in doing that mm. there, there, uh, just uh, another follow up question to Rod Larsen because uh, you um, through IPI and, and, and through your work uh, you're also uh, well informed about the thinking in Washington uh, DC and there's been a lot of uh, talk about uh, a peace plan uh, coming uh, from DC. Uh, we heard Mr. Arakat uh, not uh, being too um, optimistic uh, around this. But do you think there will be a peace plan coming uh, from DC? And will this peace plan be based on a two state solution? And could there be a surprise that the Israelis could be more disappointed with what comes from uh, DC uh, than the Palestinians? Or is this. Um, would that be a very naive uh, way of thinking in the current circumstances? I mean, I do not have any uh, privileged uh, uh, knowledge about the peace plan, but my impression is that there is a peace plan in development, but it's in development. Uh, I've been working with several um, uh, US administrations uh, uh, over the years, and the first two years is always a learning period. Uh, and I think there is a learning process going on here where uh, the key players increasingly are <laughs> understanding the complexities of the, uh, uh, of the issues. And I think uh, they will hold back in doing uh, dramatic moves which might make the whole situation unravel. But uh, I, I'm not privy to any privileged information here, but uh, this is uh, something which... Um, is derived from experiences with other U.S. administrations. But I, I guess if there's a peace plan, it needs to be based on a two-state solution? Or could it be one without? I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, but if it's not based on a two-state solution, it would not fly. Since um, you were referred to her as an optimist, I, I'm not always seeing you as that uh, on the region. But I want to end uh, this, I think, uh, extremely important, but uh, uh, also um, very nuanced uh, panel, but uh, also showing all the complexities that we're faced with. I, I want to end with someone that, uh, of course, prepared this Oslo process that no one expected, uh, making uh, the impossible uh, possible at that time. But the implementation of the process has probably not been uh, as you expected when you were there at, uh, in front of the White House uh, signing the Oslo uh, peace process. But when you look now um, at the Israeli situation, the Palestinian situation, the development in the Gulf and in, in the Arab world, um, what is the most optimistic blueprint you can show us uh, for the five uh, coming years, also uh, including uh, the U.S. administration. What, what, is there a way to realistically break this impasse? Or when you say it will take a long time, this time is not ripe now. So there will be a muddling through in the coming years. And then later on, there will again be momentum around the peace process. If you could uh, kind of summarize this uh, at the end for us, uh, I would appreciate it. You're always asking me uh, very easy questions. <laughs> uh, uh, look, um, uh, I would not predict, uh, but I can advise. 
So uh, what I would do if I were on the Palestinian side, I would not dismiss per se anything which comes from Washington unseen. What I would say is that this is a piece of ideas. We, may, we might dislike some of them. We might like some. We can use it as a basis for discussions with our uh, Israeli counterparts, but not see it as a diktat. That would be my advice to, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the Palestinians. And uh, I mean, if it's put on the table like that, it can be one of many papers which are put on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't dismiss, per se, unseen. Uh, what I would do uh, if I were uh, Israeli is that I would tell the Palestinians, we will recognize the Palestinian state and have state-to-state -state negotiations about borders Jerusalem and security and refugees. Uh, I, I think that symbolically will be so important that it could break an impasse. But of course, that depends on who is in the government of Israel after the elections uh, next week. Um, uh, and it also depends very much on, of course, what not only uh, what the Palestinians do, but also what the Arab partners of the Palestinians will do. And the more close relationship w w which we now find between key uh, Arab partners and the Israelis actually could be an advantage to move, move forward a peace process. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Uh, and we'll see each other um, uh, next year at our next uh, summit on the Middle East and North Africa. And we hope things are looking a little bit brighter when it comes to this topic in a year's time. Thank you. Thank you.